Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have the uh, pleasure and the privilege, perhaps, of being the last speaker today. Oh, dear. Uh, but we are a little bit ahead of schedule, and uh, then I hope we can have a short discussion afterwards. I should give you a little bit of background about me, although I noticed that the other speakers have not done so. Uh, I've published uh, some books with Paul Ward in the mid-80s on structured development of real-time systems. Uh, later on visual-oriented analysis with uh, Sally Schleyer, executable uh, models with Mark Balser in the early 2000s. That phrase is key, by the way, executable models. I'm a signatory to the Agile Manifesto, which is a little bit weird. Uh, I was on the original um, group that put together SysML uh, when I was working with the Object Management Group. And the reason I was with the Object Management Group was because I was focused very much on building models that you could execute. And that's the place that I want to go to today and talk now about what it is uh, that we're trying to do. Now, at present, I'm the Chief Technical Officer for the Industrial Internet Consortium. Uh, our purpose is to accelerate the development of the industrial internet. You've heard a number of things that come along uh, from that in the talks today. It seems fairly clear to me that what we need to be able to do is to write an awful lot of software. And I'm sure you all remember the old story about AT&T back in the 30s saying if the number of telephones increased at the current rate, everybody on the planet would need to be a telephone operator. <laughs> well, they are. I have a phone, I punch buttons on it all the time. What did we do? We raised the level of abstraction. And what we did when we did that was that we found ways of manufacturing things pushing the details downwards. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Manufacturing software, opportunities, and obstacles. Now I began, obviously, with a little bit of history of myself, which is a little bit narcissistic, but never mind. My personal email address, by the way, is stephenmeller at stephenmeller.com. So you can see there's a bit of a pattern going on here. Uh, but <coughs> historically speaking here, 1798, uh, the US government had a problem. The problem was that it didn't have enough guns. No comments, please. <laughs> they wanted uh, to manufacture a large number of guns and they put out a prize. And that prize was won by Whitney, Eli Whitney. And he's the person with cotton gin and all those kinds of things, which, by the way, are all heading in the area of programming, punch cards, all of those kinds of things that are actually precursors uh, to our software today. And the key thing about that was that he invented something he called the uniformity system. Now, if you look on the left-hand side of this picture, you will see a typical musket of the time. You'll also see a lot of filigree and stuff all around uh, the edge of the uh, the edge of the uh, of the gun, lovingly handcrafted by artisans in the uh, art of making muskets. <coughs> on the right-hand side, I've lost the. Timer, by the way. Okay. Um, okay. As long as oh no, that's a very dangerous thing. To say. <laughs> you have no idea. Uh, so in any event, if you look on the right hand side, then you can see that this is not quite such a pretty little thing. But the manner in which it was manufactured was by using uniform components that were assembled according to rules. Now the guns on the left were manufactured by people called fitters, and what they did was that they assembled the components that were kind of roughly crafted, and they put them all together, and they chiseled, and they sawed, and they whatever it is you do to get everything to fit perfectly. And then they were the people that fired the gun first. Because <laughs> if they hadn't done it right, you were in trouble. And they wanted the gun maker, of course, to be the person that was in trouble, not some soldier on the front line. Now on the right hand side, what's happening here is that these components are manufactured to very, very fine specifications. And then assembled by people who do not have the skills that the fitters have. And this enabled Whitney both to win a prize and to manufacture all of the uh, guns, which is a good thing. Now unfortunately, today's development paradigm is primarily oriented towards the former view of how you build muscle. Which is to say, each one needs to be lovingly handcrafted, admittedly, with various components that we can bring together. 
And what we do is we begin with a rough and abstract statement of the problem. And then what we do is we add information, preliminary design. And so if you look at the model at the beginning of the project, and you look at the model a few days, weeks, months in, what you'll see is the same bare bones plus a whole bunch of other stuff. And then as you proceed, you add more and more and more stuff. And then finally, you have the code. And the reason that I've shown this as one big yellow blob at the end is because that then becomes truth. And if people talk about trying to round the trip all of this, what they do is that they look at that target code and say, I can build you a graphical rendition of that code, and I'm going to call that a model. But really, what it is, is just all of that stuff that we've worked our way through at the front, and now the code is the only thing, and this red thing that we did at the front here, some analysis, that's gone. It's just not there. Right? And this is a very typical, elaborative approach, just like the musketeers building their filigree muskets, approach to developing software. You just keep on adding stuff and adding stuff and adding stuff until you get to a point uh, that you can rely solely on the code. And of course, what happens then is the model is either thrown away or it becomes a burden. Right? Everybody has to maintain the model. Right. That'll be the day. <laughs> what we need to do, therefore, is to think in terms of how we can make software development something that can be generated more uniformly. And this is actually quite difficult um, to describe. Software has always been very difficult uh, to describe, I think. Uh, one of my favorite stories uh, is reportedly, I don't know this for a fact, regarding Barry Bain, uh, who was a young officer on an aircraft carrier, and he's hacking away on the software. And in comes the uh, big officer, very stiff, of course, lots of things on his uh, shirt. And it says, weight control officer. And the weight control officer asks Barry, I understand you're writing all of this software. Uh, and I'm the weight control officer, because it's got to go onto the airplane, and I need to know how much it weighs. And Barry says it doesn't weigh anything. <laughs> and the weight control officer is confused, so Barry gives him an explanation, and everybody is happy, except the weight control officer, who goes away. Comes back, week, whatever, later, and says, hello, I'm, you know, whatever it is, major something or another, I'm the weight control officer, and I understand that we're spending several million dollars on this software. Well, yes, sir, that's true. Uh, so, how much does it weigh? <laughs> uh, yes, well, does it weigh anything? He goes away, comes back again, knocks on the door, triumphantly this time, and says, I'm the weight control officer, and I want to know how much this weighs. And Barry, once again, says, no. Nope doesn't weigh anything, so goes outside, picks up a deck of cards, there's a number of people here with grey hair who remember those things, he brings it in and says, is this software? And Barry says, yes. Okay, so how much does it weigh? And Barry says, nothing, it's because we use the holes. <laughs> I don't know whether that story is true, but I very much love it. Um, but it does, it does um, illustrate the difficulty of trying to represent or describe software. And that's the reason why I chose this funny little diagram over here on the right-hand side. Um, imagine this as being the architecture of the system. Now, the key thing that when you look at this is that it comprises a small set of elements. If you look at it carefully, I do have a pointer here, which is a good thing. Look at this, for example. It's essentially an empty square, a hollowed out square, right, with this taken off the side there. And this is the same pattern. And this is a hollow triangle. And then there are these uh, sliders in here, which are essentially um, smaller triangles that are crafted exactly, this goes back to the gut analogy, right? So that you know that they will fit together. You also need a set of rules, therefore, uh, that could tell you how it is that these components fit. So if you have an empty square and four triangles, how do you assemble them to make this shape? Now, if you have the components, the squares and the triangles, and you have the rules, you can assemble something that you know will fit. That you know will fit. Right? And this goes to a, a word that we heard early on in the afternoon, composability. Right? You can know that it fits. Now, if you 
try and hold this image of how we might build software, suddenly, code generation is not a cocktail party myth anymore. So I was having um, 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 an evening with some friends of mine who are in the requirements business, and he was asking, well, how, how, how are things going along? And I said, well, you know, executable models, they're no longer a cocktail party myth. And he said, well, that's progress. And then we had another party. <laughs> <laughs> What we need to do here, clearly, uh, is to change the development paradigm. This is exactly the same idea as this notion that we had in respect to Whitney's uniformity system. If we can build an executable application model, and by that I mean something that has the details that you need to know about how something is going to work, in such a way that you can literally execute it. Now think about it this way. Let's say that I have a program in C++ or Java or your favorite programming language, it executes, right? But it doesn't know anything about registers or memory mapping or any of that kind of junk. All of that stuff is taken care of by a compiler that targets a particular hardware architecture. Now imagine a model that refers to, let's say, because we're in a UML, SysML uh, kind of organization here, that thinks in terms of classes and attributes, and states of behaviors and computations that need to get done. That doesn't say anything about whether there should be one thread, or one processor, or five, or ten. It doesn't say anything at all about that. You can abstract all of that stuff away. And then, bottom left-hand corner here, you can define what those rules are. Now, I have gray hair too. Uh, when I was in college and learning about compilers, one of the first schools actually that didn't treat uh, computer science as a branch of electrical engineering or of mathematics, but rather something of its own, the big thing was compiler compilers. The idea that you could define rules that would generate the rules to be able to build things. This is what we're talking about here. A set of rules, a set of templates that say, I have chosen a single-threaded architecture, therefore, here are all the rules that we need to employ against that model to generate code. And this is systematic translation. You can call it manufacturing if you prefer. And you can see the result is, in fact, code. And that shows once again how gray my hair is. Uh, green bar paper. Yes, really like green bar paper. I remember it. So what we're doing here is to change the development paradigm. Remember that ugly picture at the beginning, with the red and the blue and the yellow and so on and so forth. What we've done here is to say, let's separate these two things, and then bring them together automatically. This is just the same idea as building a programming language compiler that abstracts away the details of the hardware architecture. What we're saying here is we can abstract away the details of the software and system architecture. Right? Now this applies clearly to software, that's one of the things that we're talking about here. We have also, using this paradigm, uh, actually Ericsson has done this, uh, generated um, VHDL, which is the way of, of describing hardware. Obviously it doesn't do anything mechanical or anything like that. But if you're describing behavior, you're describing computation, it doesn't matter whether that computation is done by piece of hardware, whether it's done by a single processor or 20, etc., etc. The only thing you care about are the performance properties of this yellow thing, funny thing on the left-hand side. Right? So by changing the development paradigm, uh, we can <coughs> manufacture software and indeed hardware. Now it seems to me the opportunity here is huge. Uh, it is <coughs> by abstracting away the details of the software architecture, just like we do with programming languages, that we can compile into different software architectures and gain scale. If I have an architecture, and in fact I'll uh, uh, refer you to one on the next page or two, uh, an architecture that targets small footprint embedded C, or Mizra C if it's going to go into cars, etc., 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 then I can build a model, generate the code to that, and I can know that the code that I'm generating is going to be correct at the 
instruction level. It doesn't mean to say that the behavior I described is correct, obviously. And then I can use that over and over and over and over again. I can also, of course, take that away and say, well, I don't want to use C anymore. I want to use another language, a more modern one, and use a different architecture, or perhaps spread things over three or four processes instead of just one. So scale is huge. Of course, it costs time and money to build those first compilers. There's a lower incremental cost, because you're not fiddling around trying to figure out which particular library of uh, data management techniques to use. The rules are defined. You can re reuse all of that design logic, just like you can with a compiler. You can also verify early. I mentioned earlier that I was a signatory to the Agile Manifesto. That's a key element of uh, the Agile view of the world. Test early, test often, verify that the behavior that you're expecting is the behavior that you want. So you can interpret these models as opposed to compile them or just compile them and then change it to the development environment later. That doesn't test the performance or the memory usage, but it does test the behavior because you've separated those two things out. And then faster integration. Now I'm, again, gray hair here. I'm uh, sure you've had the wonderful experience, all of you, of a system that works perfectly until it's been running for a while. Uh, what went wrong? Memory leak, right? Classical thing. After a while, you run out of memory and you can't figure out where it is. It could be anywhere in this pile of code. Now, let's say that one of the rules in these funny little boxes here is precisely how it is that I uh, access create and release memory. What that means is that that rule will be propagated everywhere. The system will last about two seconds because the memory will just, you'll lose it right away. It's everywhere. Now it sounds weird to think that, oh here's a system and I like it because it crashed early. But the, uh, the reason will be very obvious and it will be everywhere. And when you fix it once, you fixed it everywhere. This is absolutely now, I actually have been wandering on about this for actually 20 years. It's rather depressing. That's why we had another martini. But there you go. <laughs> uh, what are the obstacles? Well, there's a small market of model compilers. That's a key thing. Uh, I have listed some here uh, from uh, a uh, non... Uh, what's the word I want? Uh, it's an organization that was spun off of Mentor, which was spun off of the company that I ran for some time, that, gen that sells services in this area for a particular product. It doesn't matter, I was just interested in giving you an idea. The ones that exist so far are primarily for real-time and embedded systems. Uh, so we have things like tasking and threading that pops up in the windows, uh, optional instance assistance, uh, support for pre-existing instances so you can populate the data in your ECU or your chemical plant or whatever it is that you're controlling, and then integration of, it, of interrupt service routines. You can see it's quite detailed. And it's quite limited, although certainly I think there's some interest uh, to the audience. So this does exist. But then we have this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to our friend with the filigree and the guns. There are people, of course, today who enjoy, and rightly, I mean, I, I liked it too. I've mean, done the program for a long time now, but nevertheless, it is fun doing those things. And if you listen to this, and I've had these arguments, it means that people will be put out of a job. Right? Just like the fitters in the muskets were put out of a job. They were no longer required. You needed lower skill people to actually assemble the muskets. But at the same time, you had higher skill people who generated these specifications. Now, I told you I was learning about how to write compilers and so on and so forth. Nobody does that anymore. Why? Because we've raised the level of abstraction to the point that we don't need to. So, in my view, manufacturing software is a huge opportunity. There are obstacles that focus primarily, in my view, around culture, people, rather than technology. But of course, to get over that, you need to be able to generate the technology so that people can demonstrate it and show that it works. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg here, uh, but nevertheless, I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>